Sunil Kumar is the deputy director in a public pension department of the Central Government of India. He has had a wide range of experience in dealing with beneficiaries. He has also worked in controlling offices and policy framing offices. A graduate in sociology from Patna University, he has been posted in various cities of North India and is currently situated in Kolkata, West Bengal. In this podcast, he has put together some pointers for frictionless communication from his 23 years of experience. Hello. A professor has given me an opportunity to share with you some of my experiences concerning communication. To be more specific, communication at my place of work, which is a public sector office. I'm Sunil Kumar, Deputy Director. That is a middle management role in our organization. Some of you may go on to be employed in the public sector. And even if you are in the engineering wing or some such technical wing, you shall find that all decisions have to be recorded in writing for the sake of transparency. Also, how the decision was arrived at must be visible in the file. We have inherited this love for documentation from the British era and the method has its merits. Audits in the private sector are very regular. In the public sector, due to various factors, transactions of a certain year may be reviewed even four or five years later. By then, the person holding the detailed knowledge of the matter may be transferred or retired. It will be very inconvenient to access him or her and depend upon his or her memory of some piece of work carried out many years ago. Therefore, the rules and the circumstances dictating the choices made must be recorded. If in an emergency verbal orders are given, the orders have to be recorded and vetted at the earliest opportunity. Overall, in my work environment, the stress is on written communication. Whatever soft skills you have must find reflection in your writing too. Therefore, first of all, I will discuss my experience with written communication. I'd like to at first mention documents pertaining to legal matters. These are my favorite documents because of their lucidity. Petitions filed in court have to be crystal clear. The background is stated and the issue is explained exhaustively. No room for misunderstanding remains. Lawyers are very cautious to avoid loose use of pronouns. Every person linked to the petition is given a specific name such as petitioner, respondent 1, respondent 2 and so forth. Similarly, when the case reaches its conclusion and a judgment is issued, the judges ensure that the judgment should be in itself complete. The background of the matter is given in brief. The points of contention are explained. The logic, the rules, the precedents followed to reach the conclusion are worked out logically. The narrative is very lucid and the progression has integrity, by which I mean there is no internal inconsistency. When one has the time or the occasion for it, Orders issued by the High Court and especially the ones issued by the Supreme Court are a pleasure to read because of their logicality and clarity. However, the courts have their own pace, offices shall have to function much more quickly. So the files bear notes which make sense taken together. Each individual note need not summarize the whole background as the file passes through every rung of the office ladder. Still a note should be comprehensive, it should ideally be brief. If a lot of material has to be mentioned, then it should be broken down into chronological or logical heads and subheads. The value of lucidity in note writing cannot be overstated. Matters which are put up as a clear picture move through without the file coming back for clarifications. While the discussion and decision making carried out through notes is confined to a file, there are letters issued from a file. This letter is often addressed to someone who is less well informed about the matter at hand than the people who are handling the file. Therefore, the letter has to give the background in more details. Often we have to enclose documents to establish our points. I like to think of letters using the image of an arrowhead. All the supporting documents, references, etc. should be enclosed in a logical order with proper page numbering or annexure numbering. The weight of all these documents shall be conveyed to the addressee of the letter through that one page at the top, which is the letter itself. Turning over a page is a psychological threshold or barrier, so I always aim to keep my letter less than a page long, so that in every glance at it, the reader sees the whole of my statement. Beyond noting and drafting, there are other forms of written communication that we use in our environment, in our setup. Unofficial notes are used for communication between branches or divisions within the same office. In Hindi, these are called anopcharik tippani, which means these are semi-formal. 
However, the lack of formality is only in the structure. Salutation is not needed, letterhead is not used, but the language of the communication is to be as civil and formal as that of a proper letter. Communication in intended for wide audience take the shape of notice or order. These two are formal in tone and have specific structures. The main content of the communication appears first, followed by the details of the signing authority and then the names of the addresses are given. The structure makes it clear that social niceties take second place in these impersonal forms of communication. Demi-official letters are the only prescribed forms of communication which can take a relatively personal tone. These are rarely used. Moreover, you are not allowed to write a DO, I mean a demi-official letter, to anyone more than two ranks senior to you. Demi-official letters carry a special weight because they are so unusual. Emails have also become very much a part of day-to-day -day correspondence in public sector offices. However, lots of officials are still to adjust to the medium. I have seen many instances of people choosing reply all in place of reply, causing undue communication. There are some who believe that trail mails are as good as notes, whereas due to the intervening details such as sender, date, time, etc., it is quite cumbersome to scroll down and then chase a storyline up a trail mail. There are other forms of communication such as press note which, which are of use on special occasions. Anyone can download books on noting and drafting from the internet for free and learn the forms of communication used in a public sector office. At any rate, in all these forms of communication, civility and simplicity are essential ingredients. And there is a very simple suggestion which I can offer. Revise. Before signing anything or sending out anything, stop and revise the matter while trying to put yourself in the shoes of the addressee. He or she has less data or maybe even less vocabulary available than you. And from that position of disadvantage, that person is to make sense of your letter or mail. The stress, therefore, is always on comprehension, on effective communication, never on making a big impression. Now, in the second half of my discussion, I will recount for you the types of verbal communication that I have had to carry out at work. First of all, at the field level, I have had to interact with beneficiaries. I have met them in Agra, Varanasi, Gurgaon, Kolkata and certain districts of West Bengal. The beneficiaries are members of the general public. They are neither aware of nor concerned about the rules of noting and drafting. They have no use for the legalese laden language you find in our files. All they want is some common curtsy. Whenever I interact with them, I remind them that for services other than the one which I am providing, I myself have to go to some office and depend upon the efficiency and uh, friendliness of the people working there. This reduces the natural antagonism we feel towards anyone more privileged. Moreover, to the extent possible, I try to pick up the special flavors of the local language. Behavioral psychologists say that we tend to mirror the pose of the person we are deep in conversation with. Similarly, this verbal bit of mirroring brings about an ease of interaction which is distinctly noticeable. In Western UP, I have seen people using Sidi Hath to mean the right hand. This does not apply in Delhi or Eastern UP. In Agra, I have found people saying Samaj Me Aana to indicate liking something. A Hindi speaker from Bihar will think Samaj Me Aana means to understand. A Delhi resident is quite likely to say Koi Nahi to mean no matter. Whereas to me, it would always sound like no one is there. Koi Nahi. Koi nahi hai. Accents matter too. While we cannot faithfully reproduce these regional peculiarities and accents, we can very well try to be familiar with them so that we can have a smoother flow of conversation with the local residents. The second level of verbal communication is with my juniors. Technically, it is quite right to call them subordinates, but if you practice thinking of them as juniors, then you spontaneously develop a nicer way of interacting with them. The attitude visible is to teach, not to lord over. Moreover, when you seem to participate in their work and problems, you are seen as leading from the front, not ordering from above. This makes matters much easier. Many of your juniors may be more intelligent or better qualified than you. All they lack is insider information of the organization, which we usually call experience. It is just a matter of time. Convincing them of this fact makes them confident. They stop involving you in every small matter. They feel more like they are essential parts of the whole system. 
one special skill to develop is patience if someone is to be praised he or she should be praised in public and with moderation if someone is to be scolded or disciplined it should ideally be carried out in private and also with moderation the target is not to break a person and fire him or her in our sector people do not lose their jobs easily the target is to build confidence and a sense of belonging so that the person learns to contribute to the process to the system like the member of public the aim is to make use of a little bit of empathy to build a connection at a relatively personal level a challenge peculiar to the current age in this connection is keeping up with the verbal shorthand being used by the youth your juniors are quite likely to be younger than you and unless you spend some time on social media you will find that language is gradually evolving while you weren't paying attention this is a permanent process but internet has accelerated change unprecedentedly next come the challenges of communicating with your peers our natural tendency would be to speak freely with our peers but one must remember that people from diverse backgrounds come to work at the same office or industry school and college do not prepare us to be completely sensitive about these differences the terms you used in joking may turn out to be offensive for people from other communities or genders so one has to take special pains to be civil and watchful while interacting with colleagues who are peers Smooth communication with peers is of special importance because they face challenges similar to yours and they are likely to have the most relevant pieces of advice. Your peer group is most likely to approach you for brainstorming on issues which may very soon arrive at your own desk. So never consider time spent helping others as useless. They may go on to other jobs and you may work together years later. It is nice to leave a good impression. It is often said the people don't remember what you said but they remember how you said it so it is always worthwhile to let the other person feel somewhat important and appreciated just like juniors with a word of genuine appreciation they too are likely to put in more work for the organization and finally the challenge of interacting challenges of interacting with a superior you may have understood that so far everything that i have said hinges upon one central theme consideration consideration is the cornerstone of civility in written communications i am stressing lucidity and logicality so that the recipient can e- easily make sense of it in verbal communication i am giving importance to empathy and the comfort of the person i am having a conversation with now imagine a scenario where you are having to interact with someone who has no idea about effective communication someone once told me you cannot choose your boss just like you cannot choose your father So if you are fortunate to have a good communicator as your boss be thankful and learn all that you can however it is quite likely that you will get a boss who would be impatient with your lack of knowledge about the system and procedures he or she may also be prone to talking down to you he or she may be unfit for the post and may resort to bullying and bluster to cover up deficiency your job is to handle your superiors so that they let you or lead you to achieve your best results boss management is an important skill for this it is important to assume the attitude of a student just the way i suggested that you should feel like a teacher in respect of your juniors with regard to your boss it is important to become a student when you interact with him or her carry a bit of paper and a pen take a note of things to remember pick up the jargon he or she is fond of learn to place matters in terms or in the structure which he or she is comfortable with It is another matter that you are obliged to be considerate to the person in charge. Voluntary consideration will somehow show through and the boss will recognize your effort to belong and to contribute. And in case you are initially irritated by the personality of your boss, wait for his or her human side to show. Show the patience which you may have not received. I have personal experience of bosses who were initially abrasive but went on to be very kind and considerate. However, I started receiving good response from bosses only after I learned to agree to disagree. That is to say I gradually learned how to record my difference of opinion with a boss without making a fight out of it. So in conclusion I will say that communication is as much an exchange of information as it is an exchange of consideration and civility. Because of our evolutionary past our need to belong and connect is very high. As long as you keep that in mind and make everyone feel welcome and valued you will find yourself welcome and valued thank you